My name is Russ, and I am a filmmaker. My work has taken me all over the world, but I'm always happy to return to Reading, the town I was born in. I love it here. Fine restaurants, vibrant nightlife, a strong music and art scene. It's culturally diverse and summers are crowned full of great things to do. And for me, its crowning glory is that it sat amongst areas of outstanding beauty, which are teeming with wildlife. It really has everything going for it. But right now, Reading seems to be bursting at the seams. It appears to have growing pains, and I'm worried that sometime in the future, it may not be able to cope with the ecological demands of a global community. In this film, I'm going to talk through these issues with my neighbours. I will have insightful discussions with some experts and try to understand what challenges the future may hold. I will get a real sense of what these questions mean to all ages. But the overriding reason for making this film is to find out how I can play a meaningful part in helping to shape Reading's future. So you've heard why I like Reading, but what does the research tell us? We boast the lowest percentage of unemployment in the UK, and it's an impressively viable place for European investment. It has rich diversity, an exciting melting pot of cultures. But at first glance, it would be easy to think of Reading as a brand new commuter town. It has a multi-million pound railway station, modern architecture, and is the home for the world's most well-known high-tech companies. But if we peel back the layers of time to long before when Reading became the bustling centre of commerce we see today, we discover archaeological evidence of human habitation stretching right back to before the Stone Age. That's hundreds of thousands of years ago. By the 6th century AD, we know that followers of a man called Riada, the Red, were living here, but the earliest records only date back to the 9th century, when the Redingers, the Riada people, fought a fierce battle against a Viking group close to where the Forby Gardens are now situated. By 1086, Reading had four mills, a market and a church, both on site of the present day St Mary's Butts. We know this because they're described in William the Conqueror's Doomsday Book, the first Great British Survey. And it was William's youngest son, King Henry I, who chose Reading as the location of his great abbey. The monks who raised and then resided in the abbey laid out key roads to drive traffic towards a marketplace just beyond the abbey's gateway. These thoroughfares remain to this day with London Street, Southampton Street and Friar Street giving Reading its central triangular shape. Religion was at the centre of the community back then and those monks wielded great power and with that sway they built the town's good fortunes which could be enjoyed throughout the whole of the medieval period. Reading, geographically, is perfectly located between two rivers, so it had easy reach to other successful trading places such as Oxford, Southampton, Bristol and of course London. Let's fast forward to the Industrial Age. Folks flocked from the countryside to live and work in Reading. Harnessing new technology with the development of steam power, we built the canal and railway systems which opened up Reading's trade to the rest of Britain and the Empire. This brought huge prosperity for all, and during the 19th century, the town's population grew from a mere 18,000 to a whopping 72,000. The industrial boom meant that more houses were needed. Distinctive red brick terrace streets were laid out from the east to the west, and in a programme of urbanisation, the surrounding farm and meadowland gradually disappeared. I literally get the sense as uh, I'm walking through the streets of Reading that I'm following in my ancestors' footsteps. And it's amazing to think of how much that was planned in the past affects what we plan for in our future. But we would do well by remembering its history because good decisions today should ensure our future. I think that it's time to talk to some real experts about how they see the future of Reading. We've got a lot of evidence to suggest that it's a place that does respond well to change. We've now got a much stronger focus on the service sector, but also on IT as well as entrepreneurial startups. So there is that sense that Reading 
has indeed been able to reinvent itself quite well. We see a, a large influx of, of workers into the city each day and this is creating additional pressures for what is basically an underbounded city. So if we talk about Greater Reading, we're talking not only about Reading Borough Council, but we're talking about Wokingham and we're talking about parts of West Berkshire. Reading's boundaries have been inherited from the 1880s and they haven't been reviewed since except with a minor uh, adjustment to the north of the town. Um, but we know that the population is going to grow considerably over the next 25, 30 years, not only within Reading, but of course uh, either side east and west of the town. And we've got to work with those adjoining authorities, West Berkshire and Wokingham particularly, to plan for that growth. If we think about the population of the greater Reading area, it's currently 318,000. And that's due to increase to 347,000 by 2037. Looking further ahead to 2050, we'll see an even bigger increase. So if we look at the kind of infrastructure we've got, mainly our road system, we can see even today the congestion and the problems that we have to face getting from one side of Reading to the other. Things like park and ride sites that we are currently developing will need to be extended uh, north, south, east and west of the town. And it means that other modes of transport are going to have to be accommodated in a way uh, that sees the private car becoming less important and other modes of uh, transport becoming much more important. What kind of issues or main challenges do you feel we need to just keep an eye on for our future? Well, I think it's the sustainability of living in Reading, how we manage to keep it a good place to live uh, and yet ensure that it doesn't make too great demands on the environment the way that we live. Um, energy is an obvious field that we talk about whether a place uses too much energy, but there are also other resources um, that come in and need to be considered because in the long run, I uh, think we are going to run short of various resources. Are there ways that we can start to then um, better use the resources now? One area is the uh, heat loss from buildings and how we manage that. A great deal of heat comes out of buildings. So improving insulation standards both on existing buildings and particularly on new buildings as well is very important. And trying to implement renewable energy supplies wherever we can get them, which means things like solar roofs. Mm -hmm. But also one particular area that comes up for Reading is the question of ground sourced heat. You pump heat out of the ground in winter when you need to keep your buildings warm, and then either that heat is replaced by the sun in the summer, or indeed you can pump some of it back if you start overheating in your buildings. Housing is going to be, the, I think, one of the biggest challenges because we've got a, a very old housing stock uh, in Reading that has to be upgraded. That means a lot of investment because the houses aren't going to disappear and why should they? Because uh, many of them are in very good uh, condition. Um, so I would hope that uh, um, in um, 30, 40 years time we will have seen much more investment in the housing stock to make it much more energy efficient. I certainly wouldn't want to compromise those very attractive green areas that we still have within the town. Our parks are sacrosanct. We're not going to build on those. Uh, the floodplains are also sacrosanct because um, you can't stop the floodwaters and we shouldn't and they are an important environmental asset. We really have to get used to using less and consuming less that efficiency improvements can only go so far. One of the, perhaps the only statistic that I would advance to you is the one that came up from a study of environmental footprints for the southeast region, uh, which was that our environmental footprint is 29 times our land area. So the environment and the way that we think about the future is really important. How do we plan for a more sustainable Reading? How do we plan for an environmentally sustainable Reading? But how do we also plan for areas that are providing people with equal opportunities. Reading is a paradox in the sense that we have one of the best qualified workforces in the country with the largest number of graduates and degrees and yet at the other end of the spectrum we have a hard core um, of what are called NEETs, uh, not in employment, education or training. Um, and they have been with us for some years and the council's top priority 
on the education and training front is to narrow that gap so that we get people um, better trained and qualified to respond to the uh, very good jobs market that we have. So we have an equivalence in terms of the way that we think about sustainability. It's not just about the environment, it's about creating jobs for local people. It's about creating opportunities for young people and it's about a growing economy that doesn't imperil the future needs of uh, future generations. Simply unable to film everyone that I wanted to, I carried out a number of radio style interviews which have added hours of conversation to this discussion. Around to inspire. There's so much opportunity. And if you're only looking five years ahead, then you're not really grabbing that. Chance. Suburban areas, gardens are amazing places for wildlife. Two, there are more bees in the, in the suburbs than in towns, and there are uh, well, it's all kind of becoming a bit of noise, to be honest. I, I thought this would be quite easy, that I'd um, speak to some experts and everything would become clearer and uh, I'd make my film and inspire some people to go down the same process that I have and hopefully, you know, make some appreciable changes for our future. But actually what's happened is I've realised what a deep and complicated subject matter it is. It's so complex and there's so many elements that we need to think about. And it's, to be honest, it's sending me a little bit mad. Um, I think I need to sort of slow down a bit and, yeah, just uh, try and get some clarity on this. So I've come to meet Brendan Carr, the Community Engagement Curator at Reading Museum, he spends a lot of time working with individuals and community groups, my neighbours. Together, we devise a workshop which would immerse others in the same world I have been. And we are hoping that the workshop participants can help me make sense of this tricksy subject. After all, it's key to our survival. We have to start acting as one species with one destiny. We are not going to survive if we don't do that. I've got some music on my phone. Um, what do you think of it? Do you like it? Well, we have no idea. Okay, cool. So, in order to hear the music on my phone, um, what have we got to do? What's going to happen? We started the workshop by using a metaphor as a game. This then helped us when we repeated the same process, exploring all of the elements which are needed to make a city run. Churches, schools, parks, entertainment, houses, library, infrastructure, hospitals, fair shops, law, banks, agriculture, charities... Industry. And then from that list, we all took just one of the elements and exploded the list even further. I'm sure it's law. Within law, there's things like the administration, which needs to be looking at the money, like parking zones, planning applications and structural build, or buildings and things like that. There's the politics, so things like the elections... Um, this then led on to many interesting conversations. Space can help reduce crime. So in fact, with architecture, you can design a green space like a park. A park isn't, doesn't have to just be a park. You can design it in a way that means there's everywhere's visible, there's no dark corners or areas where... We then explored what is hot and what is not about Reading. I see the past and the future and everything, but, but frankly, uh, we've squashed our past into what's left of these little ruins. Mm -hmm. And so I find, I find that a real fight every time I drive around there and I try to imagine what the Abbey ruins are going to, what part of it we're going to save in the middle of, the, yeah. mm -hmm. of all of these warehouses. I put a big um, bread counter near Broad Street Mall because I like it because there's lots of entertainment and... Um, loads of fun times I have with some of my friends. We got a great sense on the here and now. So we explored a little the past before looking to the future. 15 megabytes hard disk. That would cost you a cool two and a half thousand dollars <laughs> back in 1980. First thing I want you to do is I want you to guess my age. Look at me and think about how old do you think I would be? And whoever gets 
the uh, the youngest answer is the winner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody had a guess. Is what it, was the point of that? Well, the point, <laughs> it's just because I was trying to get a few compliments. You know? Just work out how old you're going to be in, 20 in 2050. 50. That's an important day, 2050. <laughs> Those are nice round figures. You're all going to be 50 in 2050, just a few years older than I am now. In 35 years' time, in 2050, there'll be 20% more population in Reading. How can we do this in a nice, smart, sustainable way? You know, how can we make sure that everyone who's here you know, is, is happy, uh, is able to get their nice-sized home with double garage, you know, is able to find a way to earn the money to get the... If you want to go through the same process to the one that I have in this film, a good starting point is to ask yourself these two simple questions. What are the most important things around you? And what is the most important thing to you about the society that you're part of? This will help you to form your own personal wish list. And now that we all have our own personal wish list, what can we do next? Thanks, Tony, for agreeing to meet me again. Through the process of making this film, I've come up with a long wish list uh, with the help of our neighbours, the things that kind of make us really happy residents of Reading, mm -hmm. and things that we want to ensure will continue to be so, along with some other improvements. How's the best way that we can get our voice heard to sort of key decision and policy makers for the future? I mean, I would encourage people to go and talk to their local councillors and uh, um, virtually all councillors have surgeries. And so uh, they, there's the opportunity to go along and raise issues um, with them. And uh, that can then result in a dialogue between the councillor and uh, um, and the, the local residents and I've quite often suggested to local residents why don't you do a, a petition in the street um, just to see that there's the support for uh, a particular proposal. Clearly if the council ignores local residents and it would be daft if they did but uh, uh, then local residents can uh, try and use the local media um, to put pressure on the council but I think Reading Council is a reasonably open authority and whilst we might not always agree to take forward a resident's proposal or some resident's um, proposals, we'll at least give it a fair hearing. You've been working for 40 years with local government Reading Council. Mm. Can you think of any real life experiences or examples of where the local community voice has helped to influence a decision? The Oracle development which has opened up the waterways in a way that uh, um, had never been done before in Reading and one of the things that's really been noticeable in my time on the council has been the transformation of our three rivers, the Thames, uh, the Kennet uh, and the Holybrook. And can you tell me a bit about the sort of spread of the, the kind of groups that were activated? The council received representations from organisations uh, representing um, angling, cycling, walking, um, heritage organisations, all of whom were saying this site um, is a wasted opportunity and uh, we, the council, even though we don't own all the land, have powerful planning policies and we are the civic leaders. Reading has over a thousand community groups all working hard to bring something positive into our lives. As we trundle on towards the future, we also need to think about our interaction on a human level. The more we engage with technology, the more we risk disengagement with each other. We will need to ensure that as a community, we still remember to teach our kids to play outside. And we should get together more to celebrate where we live, more outdoor events, more engagement with the arts. And whilst we may not be able to predict the future, it appears we can help shape it. If you want to discover more, then you can go to this website, where you can listen to all of the interviews that were conducted as part of this project and join in with this and other conversations. If I have one word for the planners, it is about heritage and conservation, and that uh, we want to make Reading a happier place for the people of the future. 
uh, we will conserve and, 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 and foster everything that we've got in the way of our heritage. I think there should be ways that antisocial behaviour can be kept down. Expand Reading, but not at the expense of losing God's green earth. Will there be more electric ports or green cars? I wouldn't want to see Reading covered in, in concrete. How will we make our local economy more efficient when there's an increasing global pressure? The common ground area, our common sort of parks and things should be utilised and kept and make sure that they're kept that way so they can be used more and more um, and used for community projects. How will you deal with the effects of pollution on wildlife? Cars and the emissions, will we not be going back to things like trams? What's the healthcare going to be like with 20% increase of people? We need a better road system. Fix that and Reading's got a future. Is there any way of increasing the efficiency of solar power? How will you import more forms of energy? Green space and beauty. Those two things alone and reduction of urban blight can give a happiness and a, and a sense of, of neighborliness and, and pride in a community. We want housing that people can use for all, for all different communities to come together so that the elderly are living with the young people. There's a mix. If we get that, we get community involvement, community engagement, people don't feel isolated, people don't feel lonely, people know their neighbours. My ideas for Reading is that the roading and pathways get rebuilt and replaced. With an increasing population, how will you maintain a sustainable economy? What I fear most is people with disabilities being pushed in the background where they're not in the community and that's where they lose out. Because if you're in the community, you have a part to play, however small, however big. My name's Riada, and me and the boys, we beat the Vikings. That's got to be worth something. Maybe a statue? Maybe?